This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are Navigating the Journey. Navigating the Journey is dedicated to exploring the options and choices for the end of life care and to assist people to talk about their wishes. It is time to transform our culture so we shift from not talking about dying to talking about it. It is time to share the way we want to live at the end of our lives. And it is time to communicate about the kind of care we want and what we don't want. We believe that the place for this to begin is not in the intensive care unit, but together we can explore the various paths to life's ending. Together we can make these difficult conversations easier, and together we make sure that our wishes and those of our loved ones are expressed and respected. So, if you're ready, join us as we navigate the journey. For those of you that have been with us over this time, we know that we have met with people of various religions and cultures to talk about their wishes, the way they feel, the way they believe. And today, we are going to talk with Representative Jarrett, and I'm sure I'm going to screw up his last name, but he is the representative from the uh, Wyant, Waiholi, Waikani, Kaneohe side of the island. And he was one of those that introduced the bill of medical aid in dying. But we will talk for a minute about medical aid in dying. And we are going to talk about, with the representative, about his district, because that's one of those areas that we know precious little about. All the news is about what happens in downtown Honolulu. No one, and then if it's wrong, it's why and I. <laughs> we just don't know about that part of the island. So, greetings, aloha, representative. It is such a pleasure to have you. Now, pronounce your last name so we get it right. Yeah, hi, Marcia. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm Jared Kiohokalole. I grew up in Kaneohe. You know, there are a lot of people on my side of the island that like that people like you and folks in town don't know what's going on <laughs> on the, yes. the Ko'olau side. It's crowded in town. It is. So <laughs> some people like not, uh, the, the feeling of being in the country and not having everybody from town come over and, and uh, cause a bunch of traffic. So. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, just getting there is the issue. You know, that one lane road, that highway that goes out. But it's a beautiful place. It's, yeah. It is lovely. So tell me the, the names of the different uh, communities in your district. Yeah, sure. I represent the 48th House District, which is actually six ahupua'a uh, in the Ko'olau Poko area mm -hmm. of the windward side of Oahu. Uh, so I have parts of Kaneohe, He'eya, Kahalu'u, Waihe'e, Ka'alaya, and, and Waihole. So the, the Waikane? majority... You don't have Waikane? Uh, actually, no, it's right on the boundary of Waihole. But that's the same, uh, it's the neighboring valley and the same yeah. watershed. The majority of my district is the Kahalu'u Temple Valley area, which that's... is actually pretty rural. Most of the voters live in Kaneohe, but most of the land is actually the sort of the beginning of the country, uh, you know, on up the Ko'olau coast. It is so beautiful out there. It is yeah. so lovely. I have been out, needless to say, lots and lots of times, and it just, it feels good. It's the aroma that, that just, um, I, I guess I'm old enough to think of what old Hawaii was, and that this when you drive through, it just has that same feeling, or at least to me. I don't know, but you, yeah. that's your whole life is there, so there's yeah. a different. So tell, tell us about you. Tell us all about growing up in this beautiful, beautiful environment, and then what? Okay. Yeah, so I, I grew up, uh, actually when I was a little kid, we lived in Kailua on Wailepo Place, which is near um, the Pizza Hut and Taco Bell, sort of right in oh, the middle, middle of Kailua. Yes. 
and I went to Keolu Elementary until the first grade, and then I moved to um, my auntie's house in Kaneohe, where the rest of our family lived, which is on Waikalua Road, right, right near the police station. Even that's yes. even right in the middle of Kaneohe <laughs> too. And our family actually has been from that area for a really long time. If you follow the genealogy, we're in the chants that go back hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, but in that area, we've been there for uh, seven generations. Wow. And so I grew up there. I went to Ben Parker Elementary School right mm -hmm. on Waikalua, and then King Intermediate. And then I uh, came into town for high school, went to St. Louis and UH. And then uh, my wife and I moved away. We went to the mainland and lived in New York for a couple of years. And uh, she went to school, and I worked in the city. And then when we had our, when we had our first son, we decided to move back because we wanted to live in Kaneohe. We wanted him to live in Kaneohe. Yeah. It's cold on the East Coast for most of the year. <laughs> yeah. And we wanted to raise our kids around the family. My wife is from Kaneohe too. She's a Miyashiro. They live right by Castle High School. So, you know, everybody was here. Our roots were here. So we wanted to come back. And what we found pretty quickly was, uh, you know, doing that coming home and raising a family on the windward side and, and anywhere in the state really is really difficult to do. There's not uh, a lot of housing available that's affordable. Um, it's just the cost of living in general is difficult and it's hard to get a job that pays you enough to cover those costs. Right. Lots of people want to do it and struggle to do it and you know those things are getting harder and harder mm -hmm. and so that's part of the reason why I decided to get involved uh, in public service and, and run for office. And I, 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 I think I'm really lucky that I get to represent the place that I grew up in and that my family's from. I talk to lots of old timers and, and people in the community who know my, my aunts and uncles, my grandmother, so it's a privilege. Did you go to law school? Yeah, I went to the University of Hawaii. Oh, great. Yeah, Richardson School of Law. And so, I, yeah, I graduated in 2013. So that means that in your community, uh, they all know you, and you all you know all of them. Is that did I get yeah. that right? So I know I know lots of people. I know lots of faces of aunties and uncles right. who who know me since you were a little boy. Yeah, since yeah. I was a little kid, I don't necessarily know them. I've knocked on doors. It's funny. I've knocked on doors where um, you know the people who've grown up with my aunts or uncles or cousins. And so they immediately knew who I was, but I didn't know who they were. I've had Kupuna tell me stories about my grandfather uh, who drove the first taxi over the mountain, <laughs> over the, the old Pali Road, Road yes. back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And uh, he passed away before I was born. Mm -hmm. He used to drive the, the glass bottom boat and do tours on Ankaniohe Bay in the 60s. And so it was really interesting when I ran and I went door to door and people would tell me stories about my family and and so it's part of that is, uh, you know, a responsibility. Lots of people know who I am, and so I got to make sure that I'm doing a good job behaving myself. <laughs> so. Well, so what what are the issues in in that part of Oahu? Yeah, I think it's some of the things I talked about. There's not a lot of housing uh, available for young families on that side, and part of that is on purpose. We don't want to, you know. Uh, overdevelop the windward side of Oahu and uh, so that makes things difficult it makes it difficult for young families it makes it difficult for seniors who are trying to live at home and and retire and age in place when costs continue to go up and you have a fixed income uh, like I said before it's hard to get a job to cover the difference you mm -hmm. know a lot of people are willing to continue to just try and make it work here in Hawaii but if you're not making enough money to make it work then you're forced to move elsewhere, or for folks uh, you know, on the bottom of the income spectrum, a lot of them are being pushed into homelessness. So homelessness is another issue. Um, education, and also we have, we have real environmental challenges in Kaneohe. Um, it's getting crowded out there. We have that bay that has sustained that community for a really long time. And so I've focused since I got in office on trying to make sure that we're managing our resources in that area in a responsible way, and really that it's, uh, we're leading with the community. We're letting the community take the, the lead role on how to manage those resources and what exactly we're going to do to, you know, to protect things. Do you, do you still have fish ponds in the bay? 
Yeah, we do. There used to be dozens. Now we have a handful of, of fish ponds in the bay that are still in operation. I actually passed a law my first year in office that um, restructured the way we regulate fish ponds. Uh, nowadays, if a community group wants to get together and restore a, a pond, you know, fix the wall right. up so that they could start um, doing aquaculture and farming fish, you had to go to this agency and this agency and go to the feds oh, and go oh, to the oh. county. <laughs> and so what we did was we restructured the program. You go to one office now, you fill out their information, and they make sure that you're checking all the boxes that everyone else needs checked so that you can go in and just start fixing that up. A yeah. streamline. Yeah, we streamlined the process and made it easier for, for people in the community, you know, for these, these um, community groups to go and, and just get the work done, you know, as, as opposed to spending all the time going from this office to that to fill right. out papers. Do you work with your uh, city council person to, to since he's per, uh, permitting and whatever, uh, what is it? Yeah, Zoning do. and permitting and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Do, do you, well, not just you, but all over the island, do, you, do the representatives work with the city council people to make sure that you're on the same page? Yeah. The, I, I get along really well with my councilman. We work together. Um, you know, we, we have different responsibilities. The right. counties are responsible for things that are really... Uh, I think in, in front of people, uh, top of mind things, the roads, right. police, mm -hmm. fire, and land use. So we need to coordinate to make sure That's that the state level laws, taxes, education, mm -hmm. all that stuff really works together. Work together. Yeah. Um, I saw just last night on the news about the um, cesspools. Yeah. What, what is going on with cesspools? Or do yeah. you, have, you have a lot out there? Yeah, we do. In the, in the Kahalu'u uh, area, those, those valleys out uh, in Temple Valley all the way to uh, Waihole, there are over 700 cesspools, and a lot of them are old uh, family lots that have been there you know, for a really long time. And the Department of Health recently released a report, I think yesterday actually, um, that we required them to do last year to go in and actually uh, study the issue and see what are the impacts of these units on our water resources, on our marine resources, and the environment? And uh, what they determined is we have 88,000 of them statewide, more than any other state uh, in the country. And we have 14 different communities around the state where there are measurable impacts, where these cesspools are contaminating either groundwater or streams or or the ocean. And you know, regardless of how we got to this situation, because it's, it's been a long-term problem that, that's finally got us here, the biggest thing for me is it's time to take leadership. It's time to acknowledge that there's an issue, that it's having a negative impact on our environment. And then from there, figure out how we're going to fix it. Where do we start? What do we need to do uh, to get this problem taken care of? It's not going to be easy. It's really expensive to convert a cesspool uh, into a septic system in the rural areas, or even to just tie into the city infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the neighbor island communities don't have, you know, county sewage service, so they're going to have to. We're going to have to figure something else out. Yeah. And the main thing is understanding that we have a problem, figuring out what the scope of it is, so that we can figure, you know, tailor a solution that's really going to mm -hmm. be effective. Well, we need to take a break, and we'll be back in exactly one minute. And then I want to talk to the representative about some other issues, including medical aid in dying. So we'll be back in just one minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, welcome to Hawaii. This is Prince Dykes, your host of the Prince of Investing, coming to you guys each and every Tuesday at 11 a.m. right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Don't forget to come by and check out some of the great information on stocks, investings, your money, all the other great stuff, and I'll be your host. See you Tuesday. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music.
instruments that I can play, so any chance to play at all. You know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah. Real well with us. He's yeah. been good about it. He loves that area, so. Okay, we are back. And I am talking today with Representative Jarrett. Keoho Kalole. Don't you just love the way he just rolls off of his tongue? Took me a long time. <laughs> yeah. And he is from the 48th District of Oahu, which is the windward side. And they are busy keeping the country country, which is wonderful. When you drive through downtown Honolulu, you say, didn't anyone think of keeping this like old Hawaii. No. Okay, that's a different subject. A <laughs> um, couple of years ago, I went to a workshop at um, right next to the Rapoon Farms. And the issue came up about the schools. And my question was, with farms this close to the schools, why aren't the children eating fruits and vegetables from the farms? And then there was this whole long story about the bureaucrats and the da 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 and the feds. So tell me, what is, have we fixed that yet? Are the children eating from the farms yet? Not just that one, but all of them. Yeah. Uh, so what you're talking about is the effort out in Kahalu'u and Kahalu Elementary School in particular. And it's an effort that's actually... It, the, the original person who, who took the lead on it was Eldin Kukahiko, who, who's left us, but he was a community organizer and, uh, and a really good man. And uh, he started with an after-school program where they'd palm poi and eat taro from the lo'i on up, maka from the school and in the valley. And he came to see me after I got elected and asked uh, for us to help you know, get the poi into the schools because those farms are right there in the community and it just makes better sense. And so we folded the, that school into the larger farm to school effort that's gone along statewide. And really the most progress uh, has been made on the Big Island, uh, up on the Hamakua coast. And th the real big difference has been there's been a change in the leadership within the Department of Education Food Service Program. And those folks are much more willing now to, to try and work with the farmers the vendors, and the schools to figure out a way that we're, uh, we're delivering food that's safe and healthy and locally sourced. And so I've been, uh, since Eldeen got us started on that effort, we've been meeting with farmers in the area, and we're actually going to put together a meeting um, pretty soon here with the State Farm to School Coordinator to see how we can replicate what's going on on the Big Island. Uh, similar situation, but they have, they have even more ag you know, along that Hamakua coast right. than we have on Oahu. And again, the main thing is uh, it, it's easy to say no to efforts when you're trying to feed thousands of kids statewide. But if you just take one school at a time that are in areas where you have uh, really good access to agriculture and, and to crops that are food crops right. that people eat. Uh, we have a lot of value added. We have a lot of flowers. All, all the ag in Hawaii is great. But to have areas where you have food production that you can source to the schools is really important. So we're not quite there yet in terms of kids eating locally sourced food on Oahu and Kahalu'u every day, but we're getting there, you know. And the more we try, the more we, we just uh, try to find ways to navigate the system effectively, um, the more success we're going to have. Part of the, the reason why we don't have locally sourced food is because we haven't tried for a really long time. I was going to say, did, did, did we even try to do this? No, you know, I mean, uh, budgets get cut and, and agencies and departments work with what they got and, and oftentimes the easiest route to take is the only answer uh, if you're not trying to find another way. And so we've changed that perspective uh, not only within the DOE, but I think just across the state. Food security is a major issue now. And that has to go back down to supporting the local farmers and giving them a market to sell their, their yeah. products to it's, and it's, coordinating for them. Again, it's, we don't want farmers going into the DOE administration offices and filling yeah. out forms and making uh -huh. sure they're compliant with everything. We want to make it easier for them to keep farming and find ways for, for you know, it's, it should be our responsibility right. at the state level to connect the dots for people to make it all work. And so we're headed there. Well, yeah, because 
you know, we have children that are going to bed hungry. And that that shouldn't be when we can feed them. That that's just that that's just wrong. And when we are growing crops, even if it isn't next door, but we can move crops to to the schools and to the vendors that prepare the food and whatever. That, that that's, that's yesterday's technology. Come on, we can do this. Yeah. But we have to try. I don't want to belabor the point, but you know, uh, a lot of the work that I've found that is really important in the legislature comes from issues that people just haven't been paying attention to for good reasons and then for bad reasons. You get distracted. There's so much in state government that we have responsibilities for and there's so much to do. But when you identify a problem, it's easy to just ignore it or kick the can down the road. Uh, sometimes the solutions are easy if you just dig in and meet with people and bring people together and try and find a way to work things out. So, and that's what's happening now with, with Farm to School, and it's been successful. Good. I'm glad. Um, like I told you before, we have been supporting medical aid in dying, and since you were one of those that uh, initiated, signed on to introduce the bill, and as you know, and our audience knows, that it passed the Senate with flying colors, and then it got stuck, I guess is what you call it, in the House. And so I want to know what it will take our audience to get it unstuck, to move the bill. We have a new House uh, chair. Representative John Mizuno, and they combine health and human services into one committee, which makes sense. It should have been one committee to begin with. But anyway, no one asked me. So what do we have to do? Tell our audience, what do we have to do to get it unstuck, to move it across the finish line? And this okay. legislature opens, what, in three weeks? Yeah, about yeah. that. So what do, we, the, what do we need Wednesday to do? In January, yeah. So I signed on to that bill as a co-sponsor, in part because of my, my own personal beliefs on this issue. And that stems from the way I view the Constitution and, and how we treat folks in other contexts. For example, um, we all have our individual right to refuse medical treatment. Right. The government cannot force medical treatment on any individual. Now, there are good aspects and bad aspects to that. We have a homeless situation now that's out of control, in part because we have folks on the street who need help and we're, we're either not able to access them or they refuse services. But at its core, the Constitution protects individual individuals from having the government force medical treatment on them. So, you know, my own perspective on this is if you can refuse medical treatment, then it doesn't make any sense for you to, for the, the government to prohibit you from ending medical treatment that, that prolongs your life uh, or for allowing you to end your life if you're in pain. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see any justification for the government having some sort of authority on whether you get to live or die. We don't want to encourage people to, um, you know, to pursue suicide or, or to pursue these avenues when it's not uh, you know, when they're not in pain, but when, when people are in pain and, and ultimately it's your own decision, you should have the right to. I don't think the government is allowed to make that decision. The bill uh, that made it to the House, from my perspective, um, often these issues, even when you have broad-based support in the public, come down to how you implement the program and exactly what you're going to do in those situations when uh, you're not exactly sure what the, what the right thing to do is. Uh, how are we going to have the doctors navigate uh, situations when it's hard to communicate with people who, who want to end their life, when there are family members involved, when there's conflict? We've got to make sure we get that right. If you look at what's happened with the marijuana dispensaries as an example, it's been a very cumbersome process because we've fallen short on implementing the program. It's one thing to say, yes, that's a medicine people should have access to it. It's another thing to say, this is how we're going to regulate the industry so that we don't have diversion to kids, so that you know, we're not running afoul of the federal government's uh, part to play in this. And so there are other states where um, aid in dying works, and there are states where it doesn't work. 
because there's, we don't have good implementation. You know, my understanding is that some of those issues came up, but ultimately, um, you know, if the public wants it, then the public should get involved in the process and demand that we put more effort and energy into working out these issues. We may not get it perfect, but uh, that's the main thing is you've got to engage, you've got to come, call, and let people know in the legislature that it's a priority. Yeah, and so much of it is misinformation. For instance, this, in this bill, there's nothing for old age. Trust me, old age is not a terminal illness. I'll be 80 in May, so I know that's not a terminal illness. So that's one of the things. It is not to get rid of grandma. It is not to get rid of the handicap. And the bill, bill is very clear. The biggest issue for me is an antiquated bill, legislate, uh, antiquated law the state has. So if you're the doctor and I'm the patient and I say I want to do this, you can write a prescription, but you can't help me. Because then that becomes manslaughter, and now you are the problem. You, as you know, John Radcliffe, went to court to protect his doctor from manslaughter. So that while that gets rolled into this, that's another bill we need to look at, a legislative law we need to look at to protect the doctor. But the best way to protect the doctor is for him to write the prescription and say, if you want to do this, then you can. Well, that's all this bill says. I got sidetracked with manslaughter. But the bill clearly says that the doctor has the right to do this. But if he's not comfortable, he doesn't have to do it. Nothing compels the doctor to do it. So that's part of the misinformation that people say, oh, you know, all of the scary tactics. But anyway, so again, we want right. people to tell us exactly what they need to do now to yeah. get it over the finish line. So again, it's, it's not about the, for me, it's not about the whether we should do it or not. It's about how. how? Doing it in a way that protects everyone involved. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, again, for me, it's, it's that I don't think the government is allowed to uh, let people continue, is allowed to make people continue to suffer if they've made a decision on it. And it's a sound decision, and, and they have some access to uh, good advice based on, um, based on medical expertise on on whether it's a good decision for them. I don't think the government should be involved in that ultimate decision. It should be an individual person's uh, decision. And you know, the other troubling part of it is um, if you don't have, it's the same thing as, uh, it's, it's very similar to marijuana. If, if you don't have uh, a program that accounts for this reality in our population today, it, people do it outside. People do it, do it anyway. anyway mm -hmm. And that's unsafe. It is. And, and that's not what we should be encouraging. And it, it's the reality. It's the, it's the present day. It's, we're not talking about a future issue. This has been going on for a long time. You can access that information. You, know, you can get any kind of information you want online to make any decisions you want. And that, you know, that's not the type of Hawaii that I want, where, where people are going you know, through um, you know, unsanctioned channels to go and make these decisions on their own. Well, you have been absolutely marvelous, and promise me you will come back. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you so much for having and me. And we want you back in the midterm so that we can see how things are progressing, if that works for you. Sure. Okay. Well, aloha, and thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next time. Aloha.